Hello, I'm happy to be part of this discussion at the Social Media Activism and Organizations Conference at Goldsmiths, where we're discussing subjects that are very close to my heart. I'm also happy to be presenting an analysis of two fascinating groups, 350.org and Hollerback, that are breaking ground when it comes to distributed campaigning. So first, let me, do, let me situate myself and the paper I'm presenting. Now, I'm not a career academic, but a consultant and researcher that looks at how different groups leverage social networks towards social change, especially when it comes to pressuring governments and businesses. And though I have an MA in media studies, it's been some time since I wrote an academic paper, as I'm sure you'll notice. The paper that I am submitting comes out of discussions with Mobilization Lab at Greenpeace, which is a group created within the organization to study and support leading approaches to people-powered campaigning. The research here was originally meant to outline best practices and to describe effective tactics for purposes of replication by other groups that could use them. It can be very useful to these groups because with regards to distributed campaigning, we're talking about a way to achieve greater scale and impact across national boundaries with fewer resources. And from an academic point of view, I think this paper contributes to the discussions and updates of discussions around networked social movements. In my interviews with academics writing on these subjects, I realized that many that who were looking at decentralized activist strategy, the use of social networks and digital media, were still essentially focusing on Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring uprisings. These are phenomena that are now at least four to five years old. And though that doesn't sound outdated, uh, when we're talking about digital innovation, it can be an awfully long time. So it's totally understandable that academics can only critically engage in movements that have been written about, unless they are doing primary research. On the other hand, in the activist world, especially when it comes to groups working with emergent strategies, such as network social movements, innovation happens at the same pace as technological change. And new ways of adopting and using digital media are rapidly deployed as prototypes tested in the field and based on the results that they're generating, either adopted widely or hacked to adapt the strategy to the needs of the group. In this sense, and this is a central premise of my paper, 350.org and Hollerback are very recent mutations of the radical and totally horizontal models of distributed organizing that were started by groups such as Occupy Wall Street. And that's why I took my tactical account, which was mainly observational, and tried to make a quick and dirty academic piece from it to add to this discussion. It's also why I've written this piece in dialogue with the observations made by two theorists who have published recently, those being Manuel Castells and his observations on network social movements that referred to the Arab Spring, Occupy Wall Street, and the Indignados, written in 2012, and those of Todd Wolfson, who has written in 2013 and 14 on Indie Media and Occupy Wall Street. So let me just define a bit the, the area of innovation that I'm talking about in my paper and speak a bit to distributed organizing, distributed activism, and campaigning, which are all relatively interchangeable terms. So. This is a way of growing a movement and coordinating transnational groups and actions through remote chapters without heavy direction and involvement from a central hierarchy. It involves the capacity of local groups or nodes of a movement to self-start with the help of digital tools and templates usually. It also implies that the movement has allowed for this local autonomy and even encourages it. Now, the history of distributed campaigning goes back to the late 90s when the internet was making this possible at a larger scale. It was worked on by groups such as Adbusters, Indie Media, which was an autonomous uh, activist reporting network that Wolfson writes about, 
And then, of course, it got picked up by Occupy Wall Street uh, and certain elements of the Arab Spring as well. Of all the above, Occupy Wall Street and the Arab Spring uprisings seem to have caught the most public attention and imagination. And here, academics focused a lot on the totally horizontal or autonomous, leaderless aspects of these movements to a great extent. Castells writes about them, he praises them in Networks of Outrage and Hope, while Wolfson takes a more critical view of horizontality in indie media and Occupy Wall Street. He talks about a fetishization of autonomy and ultimately sees it as a weak point that cuts short the lives of these two movements. So to some extent, horizontality and leaderlessness has become a defining element of uh, network social movements and distributed campaigning in academic discourse. Um, but if we cut to 2015, we can look at entirely new groups that are using distributed organizing practices that could be called network social movements, but ha have adapted their dosing of horizontality and autonomy and merged it with top-down leadership in some cases, and it seems to be working for them. So let me tell you a bit more about the two groups studied in this paper. I find them quite interesting because they are relatively new, but they've grown in a remarkably rapid way. So the first group I studied was 350.org, Campaigning Against Climate Change. It defines itself as a global network which is active in over 188 countries that is building a global climate movement. 350 was founded in 2008 and has a current staff numbering less than 100. It now encompasses more than 4,000 groups in 180 countries. Hollaback was founded in 2009 in Brooklyn and uh, started as a nonprofit and movement to end street harassment, which is now spread in a distributed fashion to 84 cities in 31 countries. What's most interesting to the present discussion, I believe, is how both of these groups hacked the distributed model behind Occupy and previous movements and created a blend or hybrid command structure that is at once both top-down and autonomous. So here are some commonalities I found with both groups in regards to how they depart from the completely autonomous model and create this command hybrid. The first element uh, where both of these groups you know, break ground is their control of issue framing uh, and their approach to defining actions and responses to a cause or social issue. So in total horizontal movements, this was done consensually. If you think of Occupy Wall Street and those who have studied this case uh, will remember that the, the demands or the approach to the problems behind the Occupy Wall Street protests were often discussed consensually and voted upon, uh, leading to, a, to quite an unclear statement of, of unity. And this was also described in uh, Wolfson's study of indie media. And this is not the case with 350 or Hollaback. 350's central strategists from the very beginning have always de defined the movement's approach to climate and framed it and then have chosen key campaign areas or pressure points which become part of the larger campaign. For example, the campaign to stop the Keystone XL pipeline, the divestment movement which uh, is, is aiming to block investments in fossil fuel companies, and the People's Climate March which brought hundreds of thousands of people out to the streets of New York. Hollaback for its part uh, also, has also prepared a cohesive approach to the problem of street harassment and suggests actions for its members uh, even though you can customize your local actions they basically give you a template for actions that you can perform in your local chapter. Both of these groups are also interesting for how they blend top-down control with bottom-up decision-making. They maintain a careful balance and provide 
freedoms and and the liberty to customize uh, for their local groups, which have have given them a lot of momentum. So strategy, training, and facilitation are managed top-down by central staff in both groups, as I've mentioned before. And, but the local groups have tactical and creative freedom in the following areas. They can self-activate. Chapter leaders appoint themselves. They're not appointed by the headquarters. They can customize the look and feel of their local messaging to reflect uh, local cultural preferences. They're free to create their own messaging even around events, around the larger framing of the campaign. And they can even devise and execute their own actions. So here are two interesting anecdotes that speak to how they, they maintain this blend. For 350, the uh, digital infrastructure that they created uh, around the People's Climate March is an interesting example because to get people to come to New York City for this march, they allowed uh, interest groups to create their own hubs to bring out their, their tribe or their community. So for example, there was a digital hub of skateboarders against climate change. And these hubs collectively uh, were supposed to form the basis of a living movement that, that lasted even beyond the march itself. Um, and here is a case where 350 did not uh, was not heavy-handed in its control of the hubs. They were ultimately left to themselves. But people self-organizing through these hubs drew a very large crowd out to the protest with very little uh, central participation or staff resources, I might add. So Hollerback, for its part, uh, is interesting for its use of webinars and training. Now, though they leave their local chapters pretty much alone when it comes to organizing and creating their own messaging and even doing their own actions, they have found that there's a need for framing and educating their members, basically empowering their local chapter leaders to be effective leaders and to sustain these local chapters. So there's now a mandatory three-month training that uh, new self-appointed chapter leaders have to go through so that they can learn to be effective chapter leaders. And using this approach, Hollerback has now trained over 300 leaders in 26 countries, according to their website. So it's interesting to study both of these models. They're definitely breaking ground and in innovating in distributed campaigning. Um, a lot of attention is being given to them in activist circles because the the innovations that they're creating uh, are allowing for groups to conceive of uh, a way to scale up and grow much larger than they believe possible with very minimal resources. This is obviously of interest to, to both nonprofits and non-governmental organizations uh, who have trouble financing themselves. Obviously, there are deeper questions to be probed around digital access, the digital literacy of members. Does it apply to countries where there are no internet freedoms, uh, where there's a digital divide? Uh, this, this all deserves further study. From an academic point of view, um, I hope that this study will raise the question of how to track the evolution of new network models as they mutate and change rapidly even if they're doing so within the span of a couple years only. Uh, perhaps given the tools needed for proper critical discourse around these entities, it might be impossible to catch up and to keep up. Uh, if that is the case, however, I think we should be uh, wary of nailing down any phenomena as, as was done with network social movements and deciding that horizontality is a defining factor when that might change in a year or two as, as these movements mutate and are hacked. So it's been a pleasure participating in this discussion. I hope this is informative and inspiring for others working in the field, and I welcome any further discussions or questions you might have.